Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines, and I want to do um, the beginning of a new series of programs, and I, I know that there's a bunch of other series going on, and eventually, uh, Lord willing, I'd like to get back to some of those, but today I wanted to start a series on uh, a book that I have recently uh, published through Amazon, um, Kindle Direct Publishing, uh, which is an easy way to do it, and I've just been editing sermons, and um, it's taken quite a bit of time to, to get a lot of this stuff done, but... Uh, this is the hardback version. It's called Redrawing the Battle Lines, 23 Sermons on Critical Issues Facing the Church. Now, the hardback version is more expensive, and after I uploaded everything and had done all the editing for those 23 uh, sermons to make them into chapters, um, the minimum price is like $17 and something cents. So I think it's priced right now at like $18.50. So I've, I've tried to make them as cheap as I almost as almost as cheap as I can. The Kindle version is a lot cheaper, and then there's a paperback version of the same book um, that uh, is quite a bit cheaper. But they're all available on Amazon. But I also just wanted to read through uh, each of these because I think um, each topic, each chapter that I've got uh, in the book uh, is something really, really important. I, I went back through uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of sermons that I have written. Uh, over the years, over the past many, many, many years, and uh, there's a bunch of other book projects. I'm actually working on editing another book. Uh, I'd like to publish all my Genesis sermons. That's going to be like four volumes. I mean, that's like close to a thousand pages of, of sermons. So there's a lot of editing there, a lot of stuff I got to do for that. I've been trying to do a little bit at a time, and uh, the, also the Romans sermons I've done. That will be another two or three volume thing, like four or five hundred pages each <laughs> per book. Because uh, that, that took a long time and that, that represents a great deal of work and everything. So there's a bunch of other book projects that are in the in the works. And I also wrote another another book called Am I Right With God? And um, have gotten some really good feedback from from that. Very thankful for uh, the folks that have, have read it and contacted me. It's, it's not exactly a bestseller. I mean, it's just available on Amazon. I, I read through the stuff on, online on Amazon, how to publish stuff. And um, it's been great. I've been, been glad to be able to do that to avoid the red tape of trying to find publishers because I don't think <laughs> there would be a publisher anywhere that would probably want to publish what I have to say. Um, but I've tried to make uh, the stuff that I've written uh, very clear, uh, very accessible to people. And uh, one of my precious children gave me this as a birthday present. I wanted to share this. They, they did this little burning thing. They burned this into, um, <laughs> it says burned by Lily Hines. Uh, this is a birthday present. It says, right not so that people can understand, but so that they cannot misunderstand. That's a great Spurgeon quote I read recently uh, from Lectures to My Students. I'm listening to that for the second time through. It's a very large book, Lectures to My Students by Spurgeon. But it's just got so much great stuff in it. And uh, so thankful for um, uh, his writing and um, his sermons. And uh, Charles Spurgeon is definitely my favorite Baptist of all time. He's just such a, a wonderful guy to read. And um, his book, All of Grace, uh, is a wonderful book. Um, I think it's helped many people come to know Christ. And uh, a lot of things I learned from that book and a lot of the, the clear ways that he explains the gospel, I've tried to integrate into my own sermons and my own preaching ministry because uh, of his faithfulness to the Word of God uh, and the way he preached the gospel of free grace. And so that's been an encouraging thing too. But anyway, I want to get into uh, the manuscript of this that took forever to um, to get done, and so I really like the way the hardback turned out. Uh, the paperback looks different; I, like you can design cool covers, and this is actually a new design cover I put on it. But anyway, redrawing the battle lines: twenty-three sermons on critical issues facing the church. Let me just read the back. Uh, what I've got actually, it's got a little picture of me on the back. American Christianity is in trouble. Recently, I started a YouTube channel because a number of people encouraged me to. I do not have many subscribers, and the videos I put out do not get many views. The people who have subscribed and who do watch the videos are from all over the world. Since that viewership has started to grow a bit in recent days, I'm getting more and more emails from people asking about where they should go to church. It is getting harder and harder to find uh, for, for people to find churches where the biblical gospel of justification by faith alone is taught where biblical creation is not hopelessly compromised with evolutionary and deep time ideas. 
where biblical answers are given to combat the LGBT agenda, where worship is regulated by scripture, where God's sovereignty is clearly and passionately taught, where marriage is defended, and where expository preaching of the scriptures happens week in and week out. At any given moment in world history, the Church of Jesus Christ is going to have places where it is being infiltrated and hurt by compromise. This book is a compilation of sermons I have preached in order to combat some of those compromises. I pray its contents will glorify God and serve to redraw some of the battle lines where unbelief and apostasy have brought confusion and havoc into the vineyard of the Lord. We live in dark times in America. There has never been a better time to reintroduce the glorious light of the biblical Christian faith. And so that was what I was doing. And looking back through the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sermons uh, that I've preached, uh, looking for what are some of the key ones uh, on the most important issues of our time where we see apostasy, where we see compromise, where we see uh, people um, knuckling into culture and where we see the church following instead of leading. And so that's what that, that book is for. And um, not many people have seen it or, or read it yet, I think. Um, but the few that have, uh, have encouraged me. So I've, I've been thankful for, for that. But I want to go ahead and actually, I was thinking maybe in this first video, instead of going through the first chapter, uh, I just want to go through the table of contents and just kind of give an overview why I picked what I did here uh, in terms of the, uh, the chapters and what I, I put in this book, the 23 uh, chapters that redraw the battle lines. So chapter one is on Genesis one creation in six days. And basically this chapter is a defense of uh, the, the six 24 hour day interpretation of a Genesis chapter one, uh, which I became thoroughly convinced of while I was in seminary, even though I was being taught the framework hypothesis and uh, one thing I emphasized in this message, I remember preaching this long, long ago uh, when I did, went through the whole book of Genesis years ago. Um, I, I remember I wrote here in the, in the opening part of the sermon, I preached this sermon recognizing fully that it would have been completely unnecessary for the vast majority of church history. In fact, if you could transport every Christian from the first 18 centuries after the time of Christ into this room to listen this morning, most of them would leave scratching their heads wondering why such a sermon would be preached at all. The reason most Christians from the first 18 centuries after Christ would not understand why this message would need to be preached is the vast majority of commentators, ministers, and Bible scholars throughout those first 18 centuries have understood exactly what was meant in this passage by the Hebrew word yom, which is translated day. But all of that has changed in the last 200 years or so. Suddenly, we are now faced with what is called the day-age theory, interpreting each day in Genesis 1 to refer to very long periods of time, millions or billions of years. The framework hypothesis, which asserts that Genesis 1 is poetic and figurative, and thus is not to be considered historical narrative. The gap theory, which says there's a massive gap of time, millions or billions of years even, between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1 verse 2. And there are variations of each of these perspectives, but central to the argument is the proper interpretation of the word day, the Hebrew word yom. And it just kind of goes on from there. <clears throat> and I, I'll just go ahead and read the next paragraph. I think it's important. Why the emphasis on the meaning of the word day? Everyone recognizes, both old universe and young universe proponents, that Adam did not exist millions or billions of years ago. And yet, because of intimidation coming from the so-called scientific community, Christians have had to try to fit the millions and billions of years somewhere into the biblical account of world history. And the only available place to do it is Genesis 1's creation days. Even Hugh Ross, an astrophysicist who believes the universe is billions of years old, said in a debate on the John Ankerberg show against Ken Ham and Jason Lyle, that Adam, the historical Adam, could not have existed more than 100,000 years ago. And thus, if you believe the Earth and universe are millions or billions of years old, you have to try to fit all of this extra time somewhere into the creation days before Adam existed. And so, everyone listening, that's why you have these other interpretations of Genesis 1. That is the only reason. Because Christians, so many of them, are convinced we've got to fit this time in somewhere. And where does scripture start? At the beginning. In the beginning, God created. Well, 
if 15 billion years have gone by and Adam could not have existed more than 100,000 years ago, well, we've got 14 billion 900 million years we've got to fit somewhere into the biblical time scale. Where else are you going to put it? Where are you going to put all that time if it's not into the days of creation? So that's why that's there. Okay, and that evolutionary worldview and the deep time scale is so dominant today that re- really the majority of the Christian church is just kind of said, eh, doesn't matter. Uh, let, let's just focus on what we all agree on. God made stuff and, it, you know, God's the one that made it. It doesn't matter how long ago it was. It doesn't matter how he did it. We just know that he did it. And uh, that, is, that is the ultimate cop-out. The Christian church from the beginning should have stood its ground on the plain meaning of Genesis 1 and never been intimidated at all by the so-called findings of science on these issues because uh, science is often reified into saying this and saying that, but science doesn't say anything because science is not a person. Scientists say all kinds of things based upon their presuppositions and their worldview. And always remember, what is a worldview? A worldview is a network of presuppositions that cannot be tested or verified by the procedures of natural science. So your worldview, however, is that through which you interpret all the facts and all the data that come to you. So that's the first chapter of Rejoin the Battle Lines. What do the days of Genesis 1 mean? And I maintain, I argue very, very forcefully in the book and really try to interact with these other interpretations and point out what's wrong with them. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, the, the creation is not, that nature is not the 67th book of the Bible. I deal extensively with that argument. Uh, in this chapter and deal with some of the stuff from Gleason Archer and Hugh Ross and people like that. And also just point out that the, the deep time model is, I believe, the biggest challenge to biblical authority that I know of, uh, really, in, in modern history. And I'm awfully thankful for the work of Answers in Genesis, of Creation Ministries International, the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, David Reeves, Ken Ham, Jason Lyle, Henry Morris, John Wickham, Canopy Ministries, and dozens of other groups that have stood in the gap and sounded the alarm to answer the challenges of secularism, atheism, and its fairy tale for grown-ups called evolution. Oh yeah, another thing I point out here is that as the hard sciences have developed since the time of Darwin, uh, they have devastated every pillar upon which evolutionism has tried to stand. Genetics, cosmology, paleontology, fossils, radiometric dating, microbiology, most of which were either in their infancy, if they existed at all, as scientific disciplines in Darwin's day, they have stacked insurmountable problems up against the evolutionary hypothesis. Creation Ministries International did an excellent video and an excellent book called Evolution's Achilles Heels, in which those problems are exposed uh, in great detail. And so I would definitely recommend that to you. All right, so that's chapter one, uh, creation in six days, Genesis one, creation in six days. Chapter two, what the rest of scripture says about Genesis one through 11. Pardon me. The first three chapters of this 23 chapter long book are about creation and evolution. And uh, that's very much purposeful on my part because I think that that, pardon me, that that is one of the biggest challenges, not only of our time, I think it's one of the biggest challenges to biblical authority in the entire history of the, of the church, both before and after the coming of Christ. So what does the rest of scripture say about Genesis 1 through 11? In this chapter, I kind of address the, the question, what is the true and full sense of Genesis chapters 1 through 11? That's the first part of the, um, of the sermon, of the message of this chapter. And then I go through Jesus in Genesis 1 through 11. How, how does Jesus treat the material there? And then the rest of the Bible, the rest of Scripture with Genesis 1 through 11. And what I try to point out here is that the entire Bible, uh, Jesus especially, uh, really makes use of Genesis 1 through 11 as literal history, including the creation days themselves. Because Jesus speaks of the creation of Adam and Eve at the beginning. Now, we know that Adam and Eve were not created until day six. However, if you embrace this old time scale, this 15 billion year long time scale, you don't have Adam and Eve at the beginning. You have them at the tail end of the majority 
of the universe's entire history. And yet, that's just not the case. Jesus clearly believes the day is to be 24-hour days. <clears throat> okay, and there's other stuff, and I'm tempted to read all this. <laughs> there's this quotation from, um, I heard this uh, uh, YouTube video of William Lane Craig talking about how how embarrassing it is that half of evangelical pastors think the world is less than 10,000 years old. And he says, that's just hugely embarrassing. And I just think, you know, here you have William Lane Craig, who's a who holds to the idea of middle knowledge and is as anti-reformed as they come has absolutely, I mean, I've even heard him say, um, yeah, the, the council of Trent is, is really good. We just need to tweak it a little bit. <laughs> okay. This guy's not reformed. He's not a Protestant at all. Really? Uh, and he says about Rome's doctrine of justification. It really gives me pause. Yeah. That's what Paul said about the Judaizers. Their doctrine of justification really gives me pause. <laughs> Uh, no, he called down the anathema of God because, because Paul thought that the gospel was clear enough for us to be able to identify departures from it clearly. Okay. And I'll always remember that someone who, um, refuses to denounce anyone, they, they won't denounce anything as being false or any views as being heretical or anything like that. Um, the ability to denounce something as false, that's clearly false is an index of devotion to truth. Because he who cannot curse cannot bless either. So that's a really, really important thing to remember. Okay, and of course, William Lane Craig and so many today say, we've got to convince young people that the Bible does not take a position on the age of the earth or the age of the universe. That, that's kind of their end goal, is to make sure that nobody takes a position on this. So then we get into Jesus in Genesis 1-12. to and Oh yeah, found this great quotation in the book titled Inerrancy. It was uh, put together by the, uh, the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy. Uh, John Wenham, uh, a scholar, uh, wrote a chapter called Christ's View of Scripture. As I recall, that's the opening chapter of the book. He wrote this great paragraph, quote, Jesus consistently treats Old Testament historical narratives as straightforward records of fact. He refers to Abel, Noah, Abraham, the institution of circumcision, Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot, Isaac and Jacob, Manna, the snake in the desert, David eating the consecrated bread, David as a psalm writer, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, and Zechariah. Okay, so stop there. Jesus refers to everything in Genesis 1 to 11, and everything in the Old Testament too, as historical fact. He does. Jesus believed in creation. He believed in Noah's ark, Noah's flood, Cain and Abel, Abraham, circumcision, Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, Jesus refers constantly to those parts of the Old Testament as being literal historical fact. Wenham continues here. The last passage brings out Jesus' sense of the unity of history and his grasp of its wide sweep. His eye surveys the whole course of history from the creation of the world to this generation. He repeatedly refers to Moses as the giver of the law. He frequently mentions the sufferings of the true prophets and comments on the, on the popularity of the false prophets. He sets the stamp of his approval on such significant passages as Genesis 1 and 2. These quotations are taken by our Lord more or less at random from different parts of the Old Testament, and some periods of its history are covered more fully than others. Yet it is evident that he was familiar with most, if not all, of the Old Testament, and that he treated all parts of it equally as history. Curiously enough, the narratives that are least acceptable to the modern mind are the very ones that Jesus seemed most fond of choosing for illustrations, end quote. And I've said many times, um, until someone can give me a good reason to think that liberals and German higher critics and these new interpretations, until someone can give me a good reason to think that any of them are smarter than God incarnate in Jesus Christ, I'm going to stick with Jesus and believe what he thought about those things. Okay, so that's the uh, the second <clears throat> chapter. Let me see if there's anything else in here. I would love to read through the whole thing, but I, I would like to uh, get... Um, to, to some more here. I want to go do an overview of the whole book and then go into more detail and kind of go over the whole redrawing the battle lines series if I can here. Okay, yeah, go through some passages. Jesus clearly believes Adam and Eve were there from the beginning and gives some good quotations from Terry Mortensen and he's done a lot of good work on that. Uh, then you get to the rest of scripture in Genesis 1 through 11. 
um, the, the giving of the law, the fourth commandment, six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rest of the seventh day. Our work week is based on the six days of creation. And there's no reason to think that that's just a, it's just six days in the literature to just to make a, to, to make it easier for this, but that these are six literal days. Adam and Eve were real historical people. And there's passage after passage that alludes to them. Uh, Paul's entire discussion of the Adam Christ typology in Romans 5, 12 through 19 assumes the literal and historical Adam in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And I wanted to say, um, I, I really do think that uh, one of the reasons so many Christians today aren't, aren't quite sure how to answer, and it's, it's an easy objection. How can you believe God is good? Look at this mess that he created. Because we, we have abandoned Genesis 1 through 11, we should fire right back to that objection. God didn't create a, a place of misery like this. God didn't create a world where everything's dying and diseased and our bodies are falling apart and, and there's sin and suffering and heartache and tears and betrayal everywhere. He didn't create a world like that. He created paradise. We ruined it with sin. Mankind has destroyed this place with sin. And so often people are like, yeah, well, how can we believe in a good God? And he made a world that's so messed up like this. You have to believe in Genesis 1 through 11 to understand it was paradise. It was very good. But then man rebelled. The literal historical Adam rebelled and plunged this place into ruin and sin. Yeah, more. there's so much stuff we could cover here. Cain's murder of Abel is a historical fact. The global flood and the preservation of man and all air-breathing animals in Noah's Ark is a historical fact. The rest of scripture treats it that way. Isaiah 54 verse 9, for this is like the waters of Noah to me, for I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth. So have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. Hebrews eleven seven. by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. What does Isaiah assume? Noah's ark actually happened and was real. What does the author of Hebrews assume? Noah was a real person. He really built an ark. Eight people were saved from a worldwide flood through it. What does the rest of scripture do with Genesis 1 through 11? It treats it as literal fact and historical fact. 1 Peter 3, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. What does Peter think? Writing by the uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Noah's ark happened. Eight people were saved from a worldwide flood. These aren't object lessons. These aren't figures of speech. These things happen. And the rest of the biblical authors, the prophets and the apostles and the Lord Jesus taught that they all happened and that they're real history. So why are so many professing Christians so timid about standing on these things? We're paying the price because they refuse to. Or they'll, on an ordination exam, they'll say they do, but they'll never preach on it. They, they never talk about it because they're afraid of ridicule or things like that. But that's exactly what we can't be. We can't be afraid of anything like that. Okay. So that's the, the second chapter. Man, I got a lot more quotations in here. <laughs> I'm going to resist the temptation. Eventually, I'd like to read through all these because I wrote the book. So I, I can go ahead and read it all online at some point. But just doing an overview today. Probably not even going to get through this overview. <clears throat> okay. Uh, chapter three is the last uh, of, the, of the introductory chapters on evolution. The Bible versus the evolutionary worldview on creation. And here again, just a, another defense of the historicity of Genesis 1 through 11 and of the importance of the antithesis between biblical creation and evolution. Those two things cannot be mixed. Uh, I actually did an entire sermon one time, just the question, could God have used evolution to create? Could God have used evolution? And I answered that as clearly as I could from scripture with a definitive, no, God could not have used evolution to create but the bible and the evolutionary worldview are as contrary to one another as darkness and light okay and it's very important that we see that uh, evolution is a direct challenge to biblical authority and the christian church um, really has <laughs> shamed itself uh, by refusing to combat this challenge with biblical truth instead of 
capitulating to it and making concessions to it, which is what it's been doing ever since it first really reared its head into the mainstream. I mean, it was there before Darwin <clears throat> wrote The Origin of Species. Uh, it was there. It was an idea that was already in, in existence, but it became mainstream then. And the church um, backed down. The church of Jesus Christ uh, capitulated and, and got timid and, and um, has tried to make concessions to it rather than upholding biblical truth and standing its ground. Now, I wanted to read this one paragraph from this message, the Bible versus the evolutionary worldview. The world history that is chronicled in Genesis 1-11 through 11 is the foundation upon which every other doctrine of the Christian faith stands. If you doubt this, consider with me for a moment just a few doctrines founded in Genesis. Marriage in Genesis 2. The fall in Genesis 3. The promised gospel and the beginning of the covenant of grace in Genesis 3. The Sabbath in Genesis 1. <clears throat> the major people groups of the ancient world and where they lived, Genesis 10. The origin of human languages, Genesis 11. That animals and plants reproduce after their own kind, in Genesis 1. That man is created in the image of God, Genesis 1. That there is a covenant of works man is obligated to, in Genesis 2. Pain and childbirth in Genesis 3. The origin of physical death in Genesis 3. The explanation of the fact that there are billions of fossilized dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth as explained by the Noahic flood of Genesis 6 through 9. So, <clears throat> without that foundational history, uh, we don't have the rest of the Christian faith. How, how do we make sense of the fall of man? How do we make sense of the nature of God as good? I mean, if we think, well, the only thing that was altered by the fall was man. Everything else is exactly the same. So you have cancer and disease and animals killing each other and eating each other and crying out in misery and agony before the fall even happens. Is that a good God? Does God look at animals dying of disease by the hundreds of millions and say, this is very good? Of course not. Everything goes back to Genesis 1 through 11. That is why there has been a satanic attack for really from the beginning on its authority but especially in these times where you have scoffers that deny there even was a global flood and there's this this push of uniformitarianism you know charles lyell and all of that so the bible versus the evolutionary world view um, this is something we're very late in the game and we have a lot of makeup work to do that's why i said that we've got to redraw the battle line on that one for sure Joe Moorcraft, in his commentary on the Westminster Larger Catechism, wrote this great paragraph, quote, Scientific investigation and human experience can tell us nothing about the origin of the universe, since no human being was present at the creation of the universe. Therefore, the theory of evolution does not have the competence to explain the origin of life. Its basis, that matter in its undeveloped state has existed eternally, is a totally indemonstrable assumption based on blind faith, not on reason, experience, or scientific investigation. Moreover, it is fully out of accord with the written word of God. Although man was not present at the beginning of the universe, God was. Therefore, only God can reveal why and how he created the universe, and he has done so in his special revelation, the Bible. God alone can tell us how the world began because no man was there to see it being created, and even if a human observer had been present, he could not have understood fully what he saw apart from God's own interpretation. God taunts rebellious man who seeks to understand our origins apart from his word quote now gird up your loins like a man and i will ask you and you instruct me where were you when i laid the foundation of the earth tell me if you have understanding who set its measurements since you know or who stretched the line on it or what were its bases on, on what were its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of god shouted for joy End quote. And that's a quotation from Job, and that's the end of the Warcraft quote there. So there is no religious versus scientific way of looking at origins. Science can't tell us anything about origins because it's not observable. It's not testable. It's not repeatable. Okay, so whatever creation is, evolution is that same thing. You want to call it religious or a foundational commitment, that's fine. Whatever you want to call it, evolution is the same thing because it was not there and no one saw it. And therefore, they can't tell us anything about it. Okay, so that's the, the third chapter. Let me see if there's anything else um, in here. There's a lot in here in this chapter. Spent a lot of time on these sermons. I'm remembering how much work they, they, they took to write all this stuff. 
um, all the reading and, and studying and reading books on creation and evolution, uh, and looking at the stuff that's out there, looking at what Christians have done with evolution. Okay, that's probably a good place to stop. We're right at the half hour mark, but those are the first three chapters. <laughs> so I'm going to have to do a, a series of programs introducing the book, um, and then I'll try to go through each chapter. So this will be a real long series. Maybe maybe we'll get it done uh, eventually. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll pick up uh, and go through just the basics of, of chapter four. Chapter four is on answering the charge of antinomianism again. Uh, seemingly every generation has to answer that charge when the gospel of free grace is taught. And there's always a myriad of false teachers who will answer it incorrectly by creating new forms of Galatianism and legalism. And of course, our generation is no different. Anyway, uh, we're at the half hour mark. I'm going to go ahead and, and stop there. But thank you all for watching or for listening. Pastor Patrick Hines of Bridwell Heights Presbyterian Church in Kingsport, Tennessee. You can visit us on the web at bridwellheightschurch.com where all the sermons and podcasts are put into our sermon audio feed, which is accessible in iTunes as well as the podcast app. You are welcome to join us any Sunday morning for Sunday school for all ages at 10 a.m. and then worship for everyone at 11 a.m. If you ever have any questions about the Christian faith or the Bible, you can email me at pastor at bridwellheightschurch.org. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.